As the moderator <coughs> has said, the title of the paper is Events Leading Up to 1893. The purpose of this paper is to present an account of the happenings in the Free Church of Scotland during its first 50 years, which led to the formation of the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland in 1893. Much happened between the disruption in 1843 and the passing of the Declaratory Act 49 years later, and it would take a long time in the telling. This paper, therefore, has to be just a sketch of the course of deterioration which eventually made it necessary for the Reverend Donald McFarlane to depart from the Free Church. He did this knowing that he was acting for others also, and with the purpose that he and they would, God enabling them, set up the Free Church anew in accordance with its original constitution. That constitution was thoroughly scriptural, and generally speaking, the men who formed the church were sound in doctrine and godly. Among them also were Christian scholars of a high caliber, well qualified to train the men who would enter the ministry. So that it, was one, it was one of Satan's most wicked works to spoil a church so well suited to set God's claims before the people of Scotland and by God's blessing win souls. As one surveys the history of that half century, the progressive departure from important elements of the original position came to light when these movements surfaced in the church courts. Therefore, within the confines of this paper, I shall try to say enough about the issues that came into the public view to show that they were clear indications of the direction in which the Free Church was moving. There's no question about the enthusiasm for the spiritual independence of Christ Church in Scotland that brought about the disruption. I'm assuming that something is known of how a minority within the Church of Scotland had enlisted the aid of the law in order to impose ministers on congregations which did not want them and how in view of the House of Lords approving these interferences, there seemed to those who believed in the absolute headship of Christ over his church to be no end to this hindering the decisions of the church courts. It appeared at last that the only remedy was to leave the national church. On the 18th of May, 1843, at the beginning of the General Assembly in Edinburgh, the protest and separation were formally carried out and 451 ministers, along with representative elders, left and in another building constituted the Church of Scotland free, free, that is, from state interference with its proper activities as a church. It could be asked, were all these men who formed the Free Church as united in other matters as they were on the need to leave a church dominated by the civil courts? We are thinking back 150 years, so the question cannot be precisely answered. A pointer to the answer may, however, be seen from the fact that ere many years had passed, many of these men showed their carelessness about God's revealed will by wanting hymns to be used along with the Psalms in public worship. Here also I would suggest that the events of the half century under review could well be thought about in the light of words in the first chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith. The section gives ten reasons why the Bible should be regarded as the word of God. Then says, quote, Yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. End of quote. The truth stated there is that the only person who is sure that the scriptures and all their wording is the very word of God is one who has been born again. In certain circumstances, a person could be unfaithful to this spirit-wrought conviction, but it could also be true that approval of what was unscriptural was proof of a mind that had never been savingly enlightened. The confession statement is worth keeping in mind. Now, the first step of decline I mention is the 1859-1861 revival. An event which encouraged the demand for hymns in the Free Church was the American-type revival which went on in parts of Britain between 1859 and 1861. The initial revivalists were American, 
but they were then augmented by English and Scottish lay preachers. Denominational differences were ignored, and lay preaching was the rule. The doctrine was a mix of Calvinism and Arminianism. There was hymn singing, sometimes uproarious. There was a bench at the front for those wishing to be saved. Women and children prayed, and sometimes the services were long protracted. These activities created great enthusiasm in parts of the land. They were completely novel in Scotland, and a charitable view was taken of them in some parts of the free and united Presbyterian churches. It was claimed that the revival had resulted in many conversions. Sensationalism undoubtedly played a good part in the movement, and it is certain that the good effects claimed did nothing to stem in Scotland the beginning of departures from the confession of faith, nor did it hinder the entrance of rationalistic biblical criticism, nor the ecumenism that was making light of serious doctrinal differences between churches becoming interested in union. Strength and desires for hymns were also fruits of the revival. And very importantly, as far as the free church was concerned, was the influx of students for the ministry, who professed to have been either converted during the revival or affected by it. These later were among the strongest advocates of the liberalizing of the church's doctrine. The next step is the introduction of hymns and instrumental music. From the Reformation, the churches in Scotland had adhered to what became known as the regulator principle, which was that the public worship should consist only of what God in his word required. Praise, therefore, was to be made by the unaccompanied singing of the psalms. One of the changes that the Victorian era effected in Scotland was to create a wish for hymn singing just as was common in England. It would give a greater subject range to the praise, it was claimed. Other Scottish churches had adopted hymns, and in 1865 the subject was raised in the General Assembly of the Free Church. A committee decided in favour, and in the face of the regulative principle, and in spite of strong opposition, mainly from Highland congregations, the 1872 Assembly, by a large majority, accepted a collection of 25 hymns and nine years later, a book with 300. Instrumental music seemed a greater innovation, so its supporters waited until 1882 to bring it forward. By that time, as we shall see, there were many in the church courts who had ceased to regard the Bible as entirely the word of God, so that the regulator principle carried no weight with them. Principal Rainey and others pressed on to win by a three-fifths majority the freedom of congregations to have musical instruments if they wished. Organs were soon installed in many churches outside of the Highlands. The third step, movement for union with the United Presbyterian Church. Turning back again to the 1860s, what appears to have been the next evident step in the decline of the Free Church, and more or less coinciding with the wish for hymns, was the beginning of a movement for union with the United Presbyterian Church, the third largest of the Scottish churches. The UP Church had come into being three years after the disruption. In it, there united many of those who had sprung from two 18th century secessions from the Church of Scotland over the vexing matter of patronage. In 1863, the Free Church General Assembly appointed a committee to examine the possibility of union with the United Presbyterians. Since the disruption, there had been a hope that at some time there might be a gathering together of the various religious bodies who had felt forced to leave the established church. Many felt that this might be the time. There was, however, another less worthy motive for desiring a union with other Scottish churches, and that was the ambition to become a bigger, stronger body. In many ways, the Free Church had prospered. The self-sacrificing spirit shown at the disruption had been acknowledged by the Church's divine head. But, as so often happens, prosperity had occasioned pride and self-satisfaction in some quarters, and from this...